over well by motion. Oh, okay, now it is recording and um, uh, share the screen. Okay, uh, this, this, and we start with the Vatican show.
Okay, um, I will stop now this. Um. Please, Dan, uh, excuse me, but uh, it's possible to hear something if you make... Uh, Just a second, please, because this makes me crazy, this uh, uh, scene in Rome. Please, now uh, we can talk. It's impossible to make uh, only share screen. And uh, we can't hear nothing. I said that I said that uh, insistently, and I apologize. That's not because of me. I couldn't find a, a version. So anyway, uh, it is what it is. Sometimes things are not perfect, but it was independent of my uh, of my will. I couldn't find a, a version that has a, a better sound, and I apologize. I sound. I put the link on the chat right now, and everyone can uh, see if they don't see till now. The Pardon? Uh, on the chat, look to the chat. I put the link from YouTube. It's very good sound there, but it's impossible for you to make a good sound for us because you make a share screen and it's very difficult. Because of what? Technological uh, discussion. It's greu pentru că tu faci un share screen uh, din Zoom, din uh, laptopul tău și asta o să-ți explic dacă vrei cu altă ocazie separat. Dar yeah, este... Please talk in, in English. Here we are uh, people from various countries. Uh, it's difficult. Let's well, well yeah, I understand it's difficult, but uh, you know, anyway. Uh, sorry about this. Yes, the sound was not good. I'm happy that someone found uh, a way to have a better sound. You can watch it at home. Of course, I just wanted to, you know, uh, to, to start in a way the discussion about what is fashion. If fashion arrived even at the Vatican and, uh, and you saw the, uh, the faces of the, of the priests and the nuns, none was uh, smiling. They were all very stern, exactly actually like the models at fashion shows. That on one hand you have the hedonism of the, uh, you know, the attires, which are more and more extravagant and more and more exotic. And on the other hand, we have kind of a generalized unhappiness that is, now I understand it's probably a strategy to create some kind of a tension between the, the attire and uh, uh, you know stone uh, faces of, uh, of of the models i could put now just for a contrast because we don't have any longer the pope descending so dramatically between us or the gods or god but we have lady gaga or we have uh, michael jackson or we have uh, i don't know i can add uh, many to the to the list and there are plenty of um, uh, videos where you see kind of something kind of similar, but uh, uh, you know, with any kind of uh, reference to to faith. But maybe we can talk about this later. I will begin now my um, uh, PowerPoint presentation about architecture and fashion. We, and I hope you can see it. Uh, just a second. Uh, I'm not sure if I uh, did. Uh, okay. Just a second, please. Uh, okay, and uh, we start from the beginning. Uh, all these things which are popping up. Slideshow. Okay. All right. Uh, Rade, why is this here? It's unbelievable. Okay, so architecture and fashion but could also be uh, equally uh, uh, fashion and architecture. And uh, I will begin with, uh, uh, with a quotation from Oscar Wilde. Fashion is a form of ugliness so intolerable that we have to alter it every six months. Now, of course, this is the typical maliciousness, inspired maliciousness, almost uh, you know, uh, pleasant maliciousness of Oscar Wilde, but always Oscar Wilde touches upon something that is not far from truth. Why is fashion changing so often? 
you know, uh, it, it's, it's modus vivendi to change and change and change and we are never happy. And uh, yeah, this has also a consequence on, on architecture to an extent. But beyond that, there is also what Barbara Kruger said in 1987, that is this, I shop, therefore I am. So here we are, where if we do not shop, we get very anxious. We, in fact, we have the feeling that we are facing the abyss of death. So we have to shop, to shop uh, until you drop. And yes, this is the ethos of capitalism. We have to shop and shop and shop, and we even shop for gods or for religion. In the United States, there is such a thing, you know. I go uh, uh, god shopping or uh, faith shopping. We shop to the left and we shop to the right. As we shop for, uh, for a new dress or for a new pair of shoes, we shop for a different faith. We are neurotical about it and we are because something is missing. And I think so what is missing is uh, 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 a different kind of anchoring in reality and in life. We are so-called free these days. But what, what do we do with our freedom? We run to the mall. Even now, at, uh, in the midst of pandemic, when the malls reopened, people got crazy. It's, it's, the mall is the beginning and the end of everything. So we need to shop. And uh, yes, the fashion is uh, uh, extremely important in this affair of shopping. But uh, uh, let's return to architecture. I will begin with the works of a young uh, architect who studied uh, at the excessive program uh, in Vienna. Uh, and uh, he is an architect and he, he worked, uh, he studied in Vienna in, a, in the postgraduate um, uh, course there called excessive. And you'll see, he is also very involved with fashion, but you'll also see some, some architecture done by him. This is his name. And uh, uh, he seems to be very successful uh, with fashion, but I think he's also a talented architect, but the kind of architect that uh, uh, without doubt has difficulties to build because of his extravagance as an architect. Now we'll see some, this is the man, and uh, you'll see some pieces that he created for uh, fashion shows, uh, and he works in collaboration sometimes with um, um, you know, someone involved uh, just in, in fashion. Uh, this is a piece done by him, uh, done with Maya, I imagine, and 3D printed. So uh, even Toyo Ito said that, uh, you know, he tries to do buildings that are kind of like clothing, that, um, you know, that, that, that they are clothing. But uh, I don't know about that. I mean, uh, you know, a building is a building and the clothing is a clothing. But, you know, I guess in some, in some cases you can see some uh, similarity between clothing and, and, uh, and, uh, and building. So this is a piece by, done by uh, Mr. Block. Uh, this is another one. Of course, of course, you know, uh, uh, we need so badly sensuality. And why, do, why is it that we are so driven by and, and in fact, uh, unendingly uh, uh, thirsty for sensational images? Because the truth is the world was never so saturated with images. Uh, uh, most of them, uh, you know, beautifully colored and most of them showing uh, incredible beauty and sensuality, and yet we never have enough. Uh, uh, and uh, Fellini tried to bring uh, some kind of scandalous beauty even inside the Vatican, as you saw. Sorry for without the adequate uh, sound. This is another piece, a detail of uh, some kind of obscure, uh, um, you know, uh, fashion uh, item. Uh, done by the same architect, the same done by him. Uh, 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 it says post McQueen embryos. 
it's kind of interesting because we are today uh, uh, talking very often about the body, the body in architecture. We are obsessed with the body. The health club is serving our obsession quite well, or is it? Because I never saw in the in the drawings of uh, in the in the in the in the writings of Palladio, for example, any kind of reference to the body. Why are we so obsessed with the body today? Maybe because uh, the, you know we live in a highly mediated world, uh, in a, in a world uh, you know digitalized and more and more kind of estranged from from a more organic and so-called natural way of being in the world. Um, so this is him with this Iris van Herpen. This is a, a erogatory, and you can find on the web uh, other things by this couple and also by him. Uh, you know, another uh, kind of architectural dress, if we can call it the dress. Um, then uh, even something stranger, uh, because strangers is very welcome. You know, we, we, I actually think we are immensely bored and uh, 200 uh, TV channels cannot uh, make us exca escape boredom, nor countless uh, fashions changing with dramatic speed, nor uh, hundreds and thousands and maybe tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of items, all beautifully colored in the mall. Nothing at bottom cures our boredom. And, uh, uh, you know, you could say, well, we need variety. Of course we need variety. But how come we are never satisfied? How come uh, we are, uh, uh, you know, risking to get the, the virus, uh, but uh, we cannot live without them all. We cannot live without the fashion boutique, and we cannot uh, live without shopping, shopping and shopping again. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I wonder about these fashion designers, you know, uh, in what way are they actually contributing to life? I mean, who can afford, first of all, these pieces of clothing? And then, you know, you buy it, let's say, with immense, uh, or maybe less immense, but maybe some people have no problem to purchase them. But then in, uh, in a few months, uh, they get obsolete because a new fashion... Um, um, comes into being. Yes, they are interesting, they are inciting. Uh, I myself like fashion, but I think I like it because I'm empty within. Something deeper is missing. A true nourishment is missing. So then we rely on the superficiality of fashion. Uh, Oscar Wilde loved fashion too, but the, you, you read his words. Uh, so anyway, I think fashion represents some kind of exasperation, some kind of human exasperation, because we don't have any longer tra tradition. You know, uh, in the past, uh, you know, a family of uh, peasants had, uh, you know, clothes for the working days and clothing for uh, uh, clothes for uh, for the for Sunday, and that was it. And they kept these things forever. Uh, all their lives and it was fine and they were all dressed the same way and they didn't need differentiation and uh, uh, the hysteria of uh, um, in the, uh, excessive individualism but we are in, at a different time so um, you know uh, 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 anyway uh, I, I expect that we'll talk about these issues because the power of fashion today is undeniable. Now, this is a building done by a project for a building done by the same architect. So we have here the, you know, the the fashion, uh, um, you know, items that he designed, and then we have the building or one building that he designed. I think this was his diploma work for uh, at the excessive program, postgraduate program at IUA in Vienna. Uh, of course, uh, you could say, what, what's this? This is not, a, you know, a buildable. It is buildable. And Eric Owen Moss, for example, built something not very different. This is a Vienna concert hall as an experiment on the degeneration of architectural primitives. This was his naming of what he did. If you are so kind, please turn off the microphone because there is a, now there is a sound. 
um, uh, kind of a disturbing background noise. Okay, you don't want to do it, I'll do it. Oh, you do want to do it? Okay. Um, all right, thank you. Um, so, the Vienna Concert Hall by Mr. Bloch, and they all work like this, and I can show you other projects by this uh, school, which doesn't exist any longer. I mean, this program doesn't exist, uh, but a very serious architect, and I think uh, his project uh, shows uh, the, the need for viscerality, the disbelief in a way in today's life. There is a certain pessimism here, there is a, a disintegration. Uh, so uh, there are many issues that we can talk about uh, later on. Unfortunately, the pictures are not too good, but anyway, we'll see other things with better pictures. Um, I, I just wanted to show what this man did, both in the field of fashion and in the field of architecture. Uh, it's not very easy to see, but it is a section through through this tormented and tormenting building. Now, fashion by Zaha Hadid. Of course, Zaha Hadid cannot uh, miss the occasion to be with us in this uh, in this field. And uh, somebody who um, um, worked for her and uh, knew her well. She, Apparently, she had a, a fashion department in her office, and when she needed to go to a party of a certain, uh, you know, importance, perhaps she would come up with a sketch for a new pair of shoes or a new a new bag, and they would produce it. They would um, make the so-called working drawings and uh, and uh, <laughs> you know build them or manufacture them. Uh, yeah, uh, you know, um, I don't know what to think about this. I mean, I know there are there were architects who designed all kinds of things, but maybe I'm old-fashioned. Somehow I long for an architect who, I don't know. So, for example, Zaha, and I have all the respect uh, for her and even affection, but isn't it somehow sad that you know, she 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 spent time to design shoes, but not uh, social housing. I mean, uh, and I'm not a social worker, and I am also some kind of a decadent myself. I love beauty, even in uh, questionable forms. But I think there is a a, a, a loss here, and and uh, you know, I mean, after all, aren't there enough shoes in the world? Do we need? I mean, how many kinds of exasperated and exasperating new designs for shoes do we need? Like Andrei Tarkovsky said in Nostalgia, you know, when you know, the, the drunk poet, he was talking with a little girl and, you know, he was happy with his pair of shoes, his old pair of shoes. And he commented on the fact that in Italy, you know, uh, every storefront window has countless numbers of pairs of shoes, you know. I mean, this fetish, fetishization of, of uh, uh, you know, of the shoes is, uh, I, I, I think, a little bit problematic. Anyway, uh, I don't want to be a moralist. I, I understand the value of aesthetics, but I don't know, something, I, I don't think there is a balance, really. This uh, pleasure principle is uh, killing other other uh, important dimensions of life. And uh, yes, they are interesting. I like uh, Lady Gaga. I would have, I would have gladly put uh, Bad Romance by Lady Gaga right now for you. And I, in fact, I will show you after this uh, projects for a house for Lady Gaga, who was, who was herself and is herself ex extremely involved with, uh, with, um, uh, you know, uh, fashion. Uh, but I, I still think all these uh, samples of, uh, you know, more and more fantastic forms of, uh, I mean, look at the heel of these shoes. It's incredible, you know. I mean, it's not a heel, actually. It gives the appearance, but it doesn't touch the, the, the ground. Um, anyway, 
here, here she is, you know, and I actually think she died because of solitude. This is my theory that Zaha Hadid died because she was extremely alone. I mean, she was not so old uh, at all, and, 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 and she died because she was terribly alone. And uh, again, someone who worked with her and they were kind of friends or they were in a friendly relationship, a Turkish architect, she told me that uh, she didn't have a kitchen in her home. Zaha Hadid didn't have a kitchen. And of course she could have afforded a kitchen quite well. So I think that that was also another expression of, of uh, of a sadly solitary life. Although she had 450 or so employees, at bottom she was probably uh, rather alone. Uh, anyway, um, because a house without a kitchen, and I, I'm against domesticity, don't get me wrong, but um, I don't know, if you deprive a, ho a home of a kitchen, is, uh, is, uh, is something really worth thinking about. Anyway, we are going to her colleague uh, in at the Architectural Association and her friend, Rem Kolhas, who did various things for the fashion uh, industry. Uh, this is his uh, famous uh, Prada Transformer in Seoul, in South Korea, and it's not an uninteresting uh, um, uh, building, if we can call it so. You probably know that this was supposed to rotate, so the wall would become floor and the floor would become ceiling. And uh, of course it required a lot of effort, but Prada, uh, was capable of, of accommodating this and you'll see um, uh, so this thing was supposed to rotate and change its functions based on which face um, or, or which face of, of, of this object architectural object and I think in this case uh, the word object is appropriate uh, touch the ground uh, again an, a, an immense effort and of course immense immense expenditures for what well for titillation for a highly bored populace this is what we are talking about you know yes we all need the holidays and we all need the excitement but it's something i think almost and yes i'm afraid i'm a little bit in a moralist mode today i i, I feel there is something pathological about this unending uh, 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 boredom that, that forces us to continuously invent extravagant things while, and this is the problem, while hundreds of millions of people, if not billions, are dying of hunger. And this is, I wonder what Prada thinks, and I wonder what Rem Kolhas thinks, and I wonder what Zaha Hadid felt, thought and felt, because yes, it's nice to remain at a level of uh, splendid uh, um, aesthetics, but, but can you ignore the so many realities of the world? Can you be indifferent to them? I, 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 I wonder. Anyway, this is another uh, you know, provocation from Rem, and he's good at it. Uh, and, um, you know, uh, there is skill here, there is an ingenuity, there is uh, uh, creativity, but I wonder a little bit about the, the goal, you know, the, uh, what are we serving here actually, you know. Um, okay, but it's an interesting exercise in, uh, in uh, you know, in, uh, <laughs> in a way, in, a free, in, in, in frivolousness. But it is an interesting exercise, you know, and who would have thought of, of a building that rotates and, uh, you know, how different it is from what you see behind, you know, that traditional building which, uh, uh, you know, I never thought of, uh, you know, rotating itself and uh, to have its walls become floors and the floor ceilings. But this is the world we live in, you know? We, we, we actually don't believe any longer in our world. How do you explain that the founder of Amazon and the founder of eBay 
and Elon Musk, they all want to leave Earth. I mean, here we have highly successful people using the word successful uh, as we are encouraged to do, immensely successful, if we can say so, immensely dissatisfied at bottom, so much so that they are willing to leave the Earth and go where? In the darkness of cosmos on some uh, planet that doesn't even have gravity and oxygen. And I don't know, I actually think it's some kind of uh, global sickness. We leave the earth, which is so generous and so still. Yes, we have a pandemic now. Yes, we have the climate change, uh, which was kind of provoked by us. But nature is still extremely generous. The sky is blue during the day, sometimes at least. The trees are blooming in the in the spring. There is grass, there are flowers, there are still some birds. And we are willing to leave this to go where? And this shows clearly that things are not going well because nobody leaves something that is satisfying. And uh, even at this level. On the other hand, I reflected upon this. We have the American dream. And I know the American dream because I lived for many years in the United States. Did you think about the fact that the United States, States had two kings and one queen, although she, the country is supposed to be a democratic country, yet the, the, the almost obsession with, with kings and queens uh, uh, didn't end. I am referring to the king of pop, uh, Michael Jackson, I am referring to the King of Rock, um, Elvis Presley, and I am referring to the <laughs> and I am referring to the Queen of the Silver Screen Sensuality, Marilyn Monroe. So two so-called kings and one so-called queen, they all died in the same terrible circumstances, in their own vomit, in their own bathrooms. So what do you make of this fact that two kings and one queen died in, uh, in, 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 in such terrible uh, uh, you know, circumstances and they were almost identical? So obviously the so-called dream or American dream is not genuine, is not real. The real dream would not make us want to leave the earth. So we have, yes, the richest man on, on, on earth, you know, the, the founder of Amazon. Another one of the richest in the world, uh, the founder of eBay. Uh, also Elon Musk, immensely, uh, you know, skillful in terms of entre entrepreneurship. Yet at bottom, I think they are eaten up by the same uh, 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 virus, the virus of boredom. And uh, at bottom, I think, uh, a deep insatisfaction. And I think this, all these fashion shows, yes, they, they might give us a little bit of titillation, a, a little bit of excitement. But I think when we leave the fashion show, we realize the emptiness in our soul because it's, they are not really nourishing, you know? I mean, you know, there is shopoholism, and I even suffered myself a bit, you know, if I wouldn't go... Uh, you know, in the weekends to a flea market or somewhere, I, I would die. I had to buy something to so-called find something. But what I was actually searching for was not to be found there. I, I felt kind of empty. I think that's what it was. Um, yes, they are interesting. The building by uh, Rem Kolkas is interesting. But at bottom, I think it's kind of empty and even sad. Um, yeah. So, you know, architecture and fashion, uh, Rem Kolkas, and we'll see another building by him also, uh, well, several actually in Milan, also for Prada. Uh, you see, I always thought that there must be a, an organic relationship between work and play, and it is important to be innocent when you work and also to be playful. But I'm not so sure how innocent these plays are, the, or this, 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 this playing, this form of playing. Um, anyway, it is an interesting uh, so-called concept, and it is an interesting, uh, you know, architectural object, and it seems to function. 
But when you think again about its uh, true raison d'etre, I don't know if you can still be very, very happy. Now, by comparison, you know, kind of looks a little bit similar, is uh, the church Saint-Pierre de Firmini there in, by Le Corbusier, which was built after his death. Uh, so we have this rotating thing by Rem Colchas, and we have the church uh, by uh, Le Corbusier in, Saint in, in Firmini Fair. But uh, <laughs> if you didn't see it, I saw it. Uh, I advise you to have to, to wear a very warm clothes because it's unbelievably cold inside, especially if you go in the winter, as I did. It's, uh, in fact, it's uh, more cold inside than outside. Anyway, back to uh, Rem Kolhas. So, um, yeah, architecture and fashion. It looks interesting, but I think if I would have been there, I, I, I would have I would have been rather melancholy and, and, and sad. But maybe it's a problem with me. I don't know. And it's interesting this, you see this picture, you see the, the, the this uh, transformer as uh, Rem Kolhas calls it, and then they have the sloping roofs of the old buildings. Uh, and yes, in the background, the, the modern apartment buildings. And this thing is kind of in between them. Um, but in a way, this is what fashion is. Is this rotating polyeder, is this, uh, uh, you know, uh, mechanism, this uh, gadget that tries to stir up our, our imagination Again, I, I have to please be kind and turn off the, the, the microphones because there is a, there is a noise and uh, I'm a little bit irritated by the, my, uh, you know, the little film I tried to show. And I know, I know the sound was absolutely unacceptable, but anyway. Um, okay, so we move forward. Uh, yeah, there is, you can read about it, you know, there are art exhibitions or exhibits and then uh, fashion exhibits and then cinema and then the special event, you know, we call it, we call them special events, you know, as if the artwork, art exhibition or exhibit is not a special event, as if the cinema is not a special event and as if the fashion exhibition is not a special event. Everything needs to be special, you know. Uh, the events need to be special because we are, again, very, very bored at bottom. I mean, how do you explain it, you know? When I grew up, I didn't have a TV. And then later on, when my parents afforded the TV, it was in black and white, with a, it, 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 it functioned only, you know, for a limited time. Now you, now you have countless channels, you know, countless films, countless special events, countless fashion shows and soap operas and so-called reality shows, which are the most unreal things in the world. I mean, it's incredible. And we are still at bottom, uh, let's be honest, bored and unhappy. Okay, so uh, unfortunately this is, uh, okay. I can read a little bit about this thing that he built, the 20 meter high Prada transformer is or was located adjacent to the 16th century palace in the center of Seoul. The pavilion consists of four basic geometric shapes, a circle, a cross, a hexagon, a rectangle, leaning towards and wrapped in a translucent membrane. Each shape is a potential floor plan de de designed to be ideal for the cultural programming unfolding over the next three months a fashion exhibition, a film festival, an art exhibition, and finally, a Prada fashion show. Walls will become floors, and floors will become walls, as the pavilion is slipped over, flipped over by three cranes after each event to accommodate the next. And of course, the next phase would be that we would work on the ceiling or on the walls, uh, or jump from the 30th floor of our building and of course, nothing would happen to us. Because uh, <laughs> we are free human beings, free from religion, free from faith, free from the gods, free from every, everything. So we can, uh, we can do uh, unbelievable things. 
to fight off the boredom, boredom that I mentioned. Anyway, now the Fondation Louis Vuitton uh, in Paris, which I visited last year in January, and I didn't go with, um, um, you know, with a big sack, so to speak, to the uh, highly advertised tree, as the saying would go. I was a little bit skeptical about it. From what I saw in books and magazines and, uh, you know, on the internet, but when I arrived there, after waiting for two hours in line, because it was a, uh, actually a very impressive show with uh, um, uh, Egon Schiele and uh, ah, this American uh, painter. <laughs> I, for someone who didn't sleep at all last night, uh, maybe it's uh, you know, forgivable that I don't know. Basquiat. So Egon Schiele and Basquiat at Fondation Louis Vuitton. And I have to say, I always admired uh, um, uh, Egon Schiele, but I, I was never very appreciative of Basquiat, but this exhibition made me think differently. I actually like the exhibition. Unfortunately, all the pictures I took are failed because I couldn't, the, the mechanism didn't function properly, the focusing, so I ruined, uh, <laughs> I ruined the chance to have great pictures, but we are talking now about the building. Now, this building, uh, some people, some architects do not quite understand, or uh, they are very critical of. Uh, I have to say, I was inside, and especially under the roof, uh, on the terrace, and it's some kind of a combination between terrace and roofing. Uh, I was very, very impressed, and so were the students that I was with. Uh, it is easy to throw with stones at this building, uh, um, metaphorically, but uh, uh, it is much more difficult to do one like that. And I, I, I think uh, um, the skill of Frank Gehry uh, confronting unbelievable difficulties, of course, self-made. He chose uh, this uh, aesthetical, uh, you know, real difficult, but uh, I, I, I appreciate it very much, not so much at the bottom on the first floor, but the top of the building and the structure uh, that supports this, uh, um, you know, uh, extravagant uh, skin of the building. Yes, you could, you could still say, because we, we are dealing again with fashion, you know who Louis Vuitton is, and we are going to see another project done for him by Mark Forn. A younger architect who works with uh, with uh, scripting and programming and so on. Anyway, this building by Frank Gehry is, I think, worthy to be seen. And even people who dislike deconstruction, uh, although I mean it is a deconstructivist building, but also has a certain organicity because, as you know, Frank Gehry. Uh, was always almost obsessed by the fish. He liked the fish. I don't know if necessarily with its symbolism from Christianity, maybe not, but he was always very interested in the fish. And he was also very interested in Bernini. Apparently he, he, he was influenced by Bernini, or at least this is why, what he declared. The section uh, yeah, if you remove this, uh, um, you know, dramatic uh, carcass, maybe you get something not very interesting. But I know I couldn't stop taking pictures, both inside and outside. And as I said, uh, I went to, to, to see it uh, a little skeptical. But when, when, once I was there, uh, I, I, I saw virtues which I didn't imagine when I was looking at the building, um, you know, uh, on the internet or magazines, here, particularly here, under the coiffure of the building, is the magic of the building, I think. And unfortunately, I couldn't find, uh, I, I had many pictures, I couldn't find them, I'm not very organized, plus some of them were failed, in fact, many of them, but I, I can still uh, show you uh, and you know, I'm sure you know this building. Um, I, when I took pictures, I discovered things that I, I couldn't find on the net. Uh, very interesting, but maybe with another occasion, maybe when it will be Frank Gehry's uh, 
first day or so, um, we'll, we'll talk more about him. Uh, I like the plan. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's complex, it's, uh, it's complicated, it's uh, visceral, and it is kind of a, like, a, you know, kind of a, like a fish. Now, these are huge. You see the silhouettes, uh, the human silhouettes? I mean, you know, we could say anything we want, but to make this possible, to control the, the meetings, I mean, look at, at, at the joints. I mean, there are unbelievable, you know, meetings here between various um, members of this uh, uh, echafodage, or I don't know how to call it, that meet perfectly into a custom uh, or custom designed uh, uh, joint of incredible complexity. So yes, I know, and we know that Frank Gehry has a, a, a lab that is uh, as equipped as uh, they have the studios or how to call them at, at, at NASA. That's how he works. Otherwise, he wouldn't be able to, to he wouldn't be able even to, to draw this, forget about building. Uh, it's, it's, it's kind of a, you know, a forest, a maddened forest, architectural forest. And uh, it's both rigorous and exasperatingly uh, uh, free and almost, uh, you know, you could even say to an extent anxious. But I, I was very attracted by it. And I, I, as I said, I, I kept taking pictures. Um, now, you could very well say, what's the meaning of this? Why did he do it? Well, you saw at the beginning uh, those uh, strange, you know, I could use another word maybe, those strange uh, fashion uh, accessories that uh, that young architect block, uh, um, uh, you know, manufactured. It's, it's some kind of, uh, you know, uh, this is the top of the building, is uh, is uh, the coiffure of the building. and. Yeah, it's complicated, but so are the drawings of Leonardo depicting a woman's hair, for example, you know, and why should we all have a flat terrace on our heads? You know, at Chambord, there are the beautiful uh, uh, chimneys. Uh, there are plenty of buildings in the past, in history, where the top of the building was the, the culmination of the building and also aesthetically. So it's the same thing here, except that here there is also neurosis because this kind of aesthetics or spatial arrangement would not have been conceivable easily, you know, even a certain number of years ago. So we do live in, a, in an anxious world and this, this shows in a way this reality. Uh, but but on the other hand, there is beauty. I actually see beauty in this uh, meeting between various parts of the structure in this uh, complicated, uh, you know, joint. Uh, uh, I, uh, it's incredible that this was actually made possible, you know, because it's hard even to, to draw, forget about building. And these are very large. So, you know, the client, and, and it's almost a paradox and, uh, you know, how come that uh, a kind of a placid manufacturer of, of uh, women's, uh, you know, bags uh, uh, invests in such a building, you know? Uh, <laughs> there is something crazy, I think, about our world, you know? I mean, you know, what is the connection between the Louis Vuitton bags and Piranesi? Because this is some kind of a Madden Piranesi, you know. And, uh, but yes, they can, because they have the money, because one bag costs thousands and thousands of euros. And uh, there are people who buy them in the infinite boredom. They buy the bags and then uh, the client, I mean the manufacturer, um, of course, uh, Monsieur uh, Louis Vuitton died. But the rather, you know, the, his, uh, his uh, you know, followers or his, uh, uh, yeah. Anyway, 
I, I, it's kind of strange in a way, you know, when you think about it, that if you put near this picture, which I like actually very much, uh, Louis Vuitton uh, bag or pochette, you know, a, a bag, you would see totally two different, uh, a, a totally different aesthetics. Now, you see the scale, you see the, the human silhouette. These are huge and it's just one and they're all different and they are even a little bit curved. I mean, the effort to build this was immense and they did it. And I appreciate them for, for doing it. I mean, I appreciate uh, hard work and I appreciate uh, the fact that they were not happy with, uh, with, uh, with uh, you know, the, the common road or the common path. They created something new. And yes, with a lot of expenditure, yes, with a lot of, uh, you know, maybe unfair distribution of the resources. But uh, I think many people, because people stay in line there to visit the building, and maybe something is given back to the people, uh, you know, to an extent. But in terms of construction, I, I, I do respect the... the uh, you know, the, 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 these complicated things that are also kind of clean, you know, and aesthetically pleasing. And the fact that he combined wood with metal, if you are so kind, please turn off the, the microphone, otherwise I will do it. <laughs> I mean... <laughs> Okay, um, look at this. It's, it's, you know, I don't know if Kenneth Frampton would have, I, I have to do something about that microphone. Well, forgive me, please. But I, I, I you know, it, it's hard for me to talk like this if there is a, 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 that noise. Sorry, Joanna, I have to mute you. <laughs> okay. Uh, sorry about this. Okay, share. And uh, from current slide. So, if I look at this detail, what do I see? Well, I, th I see my world, the world I am living in, where different angles are equally legitimate. Uh, I see complexity, I see unreason, because this is what I see. At the peak of our enlightenment, at the peak of our, uh, you know, successful uh, so-called successful domination of the world through reason, we seem to long for unreason, and there is a form of unreason here. But it is beautifully uh, 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 kind of, uh, you know, made uh, uh, lucrative or uh, is 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 is, uh, is transformed into into art, the art of building. But in essence. For me, the message is this one. The age of reason is gone. It's, I was thinking about the engraving by Goya. You know it. El sueño da raison produce monstruos. The, the sleep of reason produces monsters. But that could be also translated that the dream of reason produces, produces monsters. And I actually found the, both translations. I don't know, I don't know uh, exactly which one is the correct one, but maybe both have a certain uh, uh, truthfulness. How is it? Is it the, the, the sleeping reason that produces monsters, or the sleep of reason, or the dream of reason? Because in a way, this is what I see here, is some kind of a, a reason that is... A, a, at, 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 at the apex of its dreaming gives birth to unreason, to its opposite. Uh, look at this. I mean, even if they were straight, it would have been very difficult, but they are not. And they are all very different. And uh, so we, we ordered our world. We traced, uh, uh, you know, uh, straight uh, asphalted roads and straight uh, asphalted uh, uh, paths. We cleaned up, uh, you know, uh, anything that was uh, difficult to manage. 
we kind of banished the donkey that Le Corbusier talked against because the donkey was everything that man, meaning the human being, uh, uh, was not because the human being uh, uh, knew exactly how to, to, to trace a straight line from A to B going through mountain and through stones and through anything. But look at us now, paradoxically, we don't like any longer that straight line. And we kind of uh, look, uh, uh, if not with admiration, but with some kind of approval towards the zigzagging uh, donkey. Uh, isn't it strange? I, I, I wonder what Le Corbusier would have thought of this. So where is the straight line? Yes, there are some straight segments here, but in essence, this is a complication that is totally irrational. But at the same time, I think totally in accord or uh, with, with, with our time, it expresses our time. And yes, there is beauty. This, this joins, sorry, uh, these joins, you know, just, just to draw the axonometric drawing of one, uh, it wouldn't be easy. And uh, uh, they are measured, they are built, they are accurate. There is rigor here, there is science and art meeting. And this is just one joint out of so many. So I, I, I do admire this work, yes. Uh, another view from the outside. Uh, yes, the excessive usage of, uh, of glass could be uh, questionable, you know, uh, as Philip Johnson would say, if you think of the, uh, of the, of the, the energy bill, you wouldn't build a glass wall. But I guess uh, the Fondation Louis Vuitton, the, uh, you know, uh, doesn't care too much about the bills. Anyway. Um, it's an interesting building, I think, and uh, anyone uh, who goes to Paris uh, uh, probably should make some time to, to see it, especially at the, at the top. Now, this is a building I showed yesterday, and uh, I don't like to repeat things that I did, but uh, I will show a few other pictures of this uh, House of Dior. So uh, another Pritzker Price Laureate, but uh, uh, building for a different uh, uh, big name designer, Christian Dior, this is in Seoul, also in Seoul. Uh, um, it's not a bad building, but it is a building that tells you, uh, you know, uh, not everybody is really so welcome here. I mean, it, you can tell it's a privileged building. Uh, it's it's not really meant for proletarians, and I don't think proletarians are really uh, truly invited there on the terrace where very comfortable armchairs and maybe expensive uh, drinks are offered to the clients who are willing to buy with thousands of uh, euros, uh, I don't know what. Something probably kind of useless. Anyway, this is what fashion is. It's about uh, plaisir, about pleasure, about... Uh, you know, aestheticism, which if we remember Oscar Wilde thought was uh, so unbearably ugly that it had to be changed every six months. Uh, anyway, yeah, you, you can tell, no, this is not a place for, uh, for uh, anybody, it is not. What is strange, I just thought of any, and you, I don't know if you know, but Peter Eisenman, uh, he published at one moment for a number of years a, a magazine, kind of a newspaper called Any. And it was a little bit perverse because you would say any is like for anyone. It's, it's, uh, it's you know, it's, 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 it's for, for the people, for the, for the general public, so to speak. But now, there was another reading there, was Architecture New York, so also A-N-Y, but it's kind of funny and uh, also ironical and also a little bit questionable that here you had one of the most abstruse deconstructivists publishing a, a, you know, a newspaper with a, with a title that was actually misleading, any, you know, uh, it was not at all about any. Certainly not coming from the one who said uh, "en terror firma," meaning to be firmly anchored in, in terror. 
anyway, coming back to Christian de Corson Park, and the inside, yes, of course, is Lux Calme Volupte. You know, this is not for any body. No, this is for uh, certain people, you know, who have no problem to buy that bag on that shelf. Doesn't matter the cost. Uh, even if they put it aside. Um, I have to tell you a short story from my life. I had sometimes a few strange happenings in my life, which I, they came from nowhere in a way. I was working for a very rich lady in, uh, in uh, New York. Uh, and uh, um, Courtney Ross, who was married to uh, the CEO of Hollywood for 10, 15 years. He died of cancer and, and she was immensely, immensely rich. And so she wanted to build a house for her, uh, a school for her daughter because she was still uh, very unhappy with education in the United States. So she hired uh, some architects and I was in between them to design something there. But what I want to tell you is one day, she invited me to, to go with her car and the chauffeur to a uh, uh, Asia house, Asia house where there was an exhibition with Asian art. So we go there and, and we go straight to the shop. And there, to my disbelief, she would uh, point towards this and that and this and that and this. She literally, I think she emptied the store, half of the store she purchased. Uh, the, the man who was responsible was not a big shop, you know, was a, was a shop inside a kind of a museum, a cultural center. But there were many things there, expensive, you know, like a, a scarf, $400 or $600. So the man who was responsible for, uh, for this shop made a pyramid with the things he chose. I... I didn't count precisely, but I think she ordered items of at least $15,000, something like this there. And then she uh, murmured, uh, whispered to the, to the man who in charge of the shop, I will send my, uh, my assistant to, to pay for them and pick them up. And she left. And, you know, and I knew her and I, I knew, you see, she was immensely rich, but she was at bottom very bored. And uh, uh, so I think these people who also uh, buy in these shops, they are also very bored. As I was, in fact, at my own level, um, <laughs> in no way comparable with, 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 uh, with what I'm seeing here. Uh, but I had periods in my life with, where I, I, I love to shop. I understand the pleasures of shopping and I understand their neuroses that is uh, uh, following or, or emerging if you don't do it. Because yes, this is the time I shop, therefore I am, as Barbara Kruger said cl clearly. And uh, if you don't shop, you feel that you do not exist. Anyway, interesting, I mean, there are interesting things architecturally here, trembling, spiral, uh, you know, uh, there are some reflections here, of course. Maybe in reality is not so, uh, you know, bothering or, or uh, interesting the picture. Um, otherwise, you can tell it's you know it's just a you know a boutique uh, with these shoes uh, religiously displayed on these uh, pedestals and then the sofa that is uh, accommodating you, uh, you know, in a typical uh, environment for. <laughs> inducive to you, uh, um, you know, searching for the credit card. Uh, yeah. So this is the plan. Uh, sorry for the picture. It's not, uh, it doesn't have a great uh, resolution, but uh, you s kind of see now this uh, building uh, built by Christian de Portson Park and uh, the, the, the great uh, beauty of of life for some people. Uh, Toyoito, Todd's uh, Omotesando building in Tokyo. Uh, this is not built for a big designer, but this build, this uh, this um, this brand, this uh, building, is destined also to uh, for fashion. And I just want to say about this building that he, it's in a. It's in a 
uh, <laughs> uh, it, it's on a street. Uh, it's a uh, sorry. I, I have again to to do something about this. Okay, uh, Linda, I'm very sorry. Uh, and uh, there is someone else here. I, I'm sorry for doing this. Okay. Um, all right. So we arrive at Toyo Ito. Uh, Toyo Ito uh, is, of course, uh, another Pritzker laureate and, 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 and a very interesting architect. Uh, in this building, he, he said, I couldn't do anything about the interior of the building because uh, it's a commercial building. I, I, I was only able to, 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 to create the carcass, the exterior. And he wanted to, to, for the people inside, for the boutique, for the restore, to have those, those who visited it, to have the feeling that they are surrounded by trees. But actually the street the building is on is lined up with trees. It is a famous street in Tokyo that has this uh, characteristic that there are trees, but not as tall as, as this building is. So you can see here the real tree on the right, and then the architectonic tree-like structure uh, uh, in the section. There are no uh, uh, interior columns, so the whole building is supported by um, this uh, ornamental structure, if you want, tree-like uh, structure, which he used in the various forms in some other buildings, which I also see as some kind of uh, sabotaging uh, the, the rational um, Cartesian uh, system. Uh, the interior is not spectacular, uh, you know, uh, the fetishization of clothing. Uh, but I guess the, the building is interesting. Uh, there are the architects who built in a similar way. Even himself uh, built uh, his uh, Serpentine Gallery in London uh, in, in, in conceptually and uh, physically was similar to this, except that it was a rather flat horizontal building, not vertical. So in essence, he tried to bring disorder uh, into the building, which otherwise would have been uh, maybe excessively ordered or, or rational. Uh, many people do this. It's a clear return I mean, in essence, maybe it's not so different from what Frank Gehry did. It's the, the, the complication of the, of the building in the name of some kind of unreason. Now, if we call that unreason uh, nature, in this case, uh, something tree-like or uh, differently, that remains to be discussed. Of course, in these pictures, for example, we see in the foreground the, another kind of disorder. And that is the disorder of, uh, of uh, ducts and tubes and, uh, you know, the uh, things, cables bringing electricity and all kinds of conveniences. The chaos, <laughs> kind of the paradoxical chaos we arrive at, trying to make our life more and more comfortable and more and more uh, so-called order. Uh, and Tokyo has many, uh, I never traveled to Tokyo, but I have seen pictures uh, sometimes uh, these uh, such uh, details of urban life are uh, amazing because of their complexity. Uh, uh. Now here we have a different kind of complexity and that is the, you know, this, um, this ornamental structure, I call it, but also ornamental, uh, using the word ornamental, uh, in maybe uh, in, a, in a different way than we usually associate the word ornament with, is, uh, you know, disordered and a little bit neurotical and uh, uh, angst-driven in a way. Anyway, but it is, uh, it is an interesting building and yes, inside there is fashion. Maybe not uh, Prada, maybe not uh, Christian Dior, but still fashion with the according prices. And they have, this is a brand that has stores in other, in other cities. Now, Mark Form, the rising star of the 21st century architecture as uh, Patrick Schumacher described him. He's a Frenchman 
who is uh, still uh, rather young uh, and lives in Brooklyn, New York. That's where he has his office. And you will see a horrid, <laughs> absolutely horrid pavilion he built for Louis Vuitton again in London in 2012. I don't know if this pavilion is still uh, um, alive, but uh, I almost said I would be happy if it wasn't. Although I admire Mark Forn and I have a whole uh, PowerPoint presentation on him. Uh, and uh, I don't know if Patrick Schumacher was, was right. It's really hard to say this is the rising star of the 21st century architecture. But he is without doubt uh, a very interesting architect uh, who brings something new in architecture. But this installation for, uh, for uh, Louis Vuitton turns me off. I love embroideries, but something about it sickens me. You know, it's, it's just too uh, literal and too explicit and too sweet and too accommodating. And I, I, I felt like uh, uh, I would have liked Mike Mark Fon to tell me uh, Epate la bourgeoisie. Instead, he is pleasing the bourgeoisie. And, and, and this is a problem because I don't think we have today a valid avant-garde. Like, for example, the 20th century had a valid avant-garde at the beginning of the 20th century, mainly. No, today we have, uh, and this is uh, the genius of capitalism, the malevolent genius of capitalism. It buys the avant-garde artist, it pays him or her very, very well, and thus, the avant-garde artist is reduced to insignificance. Like the saying, uh, to caress a cat to death. That's exactly what it is. Mark Forn was caress caressed to death by Louis Vuitton, the maker of this celebrated, uh, you know, uh, you see them there on the tables. And the avant-gardist the avant lost his, uh, his bite, his acid, his teeth. And, and, and I think this is uh, indeed remarkable. Capitalism was able to neutralize the avant-gardists who historically were promoting the new and were kind of left-oriented and, 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 and so transformed them into dead cats, really. Anyway, maybe I'm a little bit too rough with uh, Mark Fon, but what I see here is, is pathetic. I mean, uh, you know, the other works by him are, are uh, uh, very inciting and provocative, but this one, but this one is provocative too, but we, uh, in reverse in a way, you know, it's because again, it doesn't say Epate la bourgeoisie is, <laughs> is, is pleasing the, the bourgeoisie. In fact, they are killing each other, you know, the, uh, this is like a, uh, like an unbearably uh, appetizing and sweet cake, you know, uh, voluptuous and all the rest. That kills you, you know. Look at those pathetic shoes and bags and all all those useless things there, you know. And <laughs> and the architecture, if we can call it so, is kind of according, accordingly adjusting itself to to this. Uh, melodrama of, uh, born essentially from, from boredom, I think. Anyway, but it is on the other hand kind of interesting, you know, done through scripting and programming by the rising star of the 21st century architecture. Okay, we move forward. But I look at these pathetic objects, really. I mean, yes, it's nice to have a nice bag. I agree. Better be nice than ugly. But, but this fetishization of these objects, you know, as if they are godsend, you know, they have an aura, you know, they are almost divine and the prices are equally, uh, you know, celestial. Uh, it's, it's something I think sick and also amusing about it, you know. I mean, this is what we are reducing life to, to these, uh, <laughs> To these objects, these pathetic, lifeless objects, or like the, the electronic gadgets. I remember Steve Jobs when he was alive and when he was presenting to the audience 
uh, a new gadget, let's say a new iPod or iPad and so on. And he would step on the stage as some kind of scent from the outer space, you know, and uh, there was a silence, there was, uh, uh, everybody was in, 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 a, in, a, in, a, in a moment of revelation, of course, religious, religious revelation. And then he would pick up this uh, iPod or iPad, this uh, so-called smartphone, and show it to an ecstatic audience, uh, some kind of a divine object. Come on, that divine object, if it doesn't have a battery or is not charged or it doesn't have electricity, is more dead than a stone. So, so are these bags. <laughs> They're just objects. Anyway, enough with throwing stones of, uh, at, uh, at um, targets that are not, uh, you know, uh, reachable by me. The envious one, the, the one who talks now, uh, dominated by envy. I'm not envious. Anyway, but I admire the, the very many. This is the company of Mark Form, uh, the preciseness of the drawings and the uh, you know, the, the ingenuity and the hard work and the knowledge, scripting and programming and all the rest. But the final result to me is uh, questionable because it says the very opposite of, of what the French try to say through epate la bourgeoisie. Okay. So we move forward, we, I learned uh, uh, very recently, two days ago, that Kanye West uh, is building uh, houses for homeless, in fact, not very similar, dissimilar from, from these pavilions uh, built by um, Mark Forn for uh, Louis Vuitton. Now I wonder, you know, isn't it strange that the man who designed uh, sneakers, uh, uh, whose price is 1,000 euros, uh, is designing now houses for homeless is, uh, I mean, uh, maybe the house, uh, you know, costs kind of like the pair of sneakers that he designed. It's something, I, I, I don't know. Uh, yes, it sounds good in a way. Here you have the guilty uh, millionaire uh, turning his attention towards the man in the gutter. But the man in the gutter, uh, would he really appreciate a highly designed um, you know, a little house, or I, I don't know. I, I feel that there, there are some perversions here. Anyway, Studio Fuxas, Giorgio Armani store. They are friends. Giorgio Armani, happy birthday, Giorgio. Uh, they are friends, uh, Massimiliano Fuxas and his wife with Giorgio Armani, and he designed, in my knowledge, two stores for Giorgio Armani, and they both have something interesting. Uh, this is the stair in the store in New York. And, um, you know, it's, uh, you cannot be indifferent. I mean, you know, this is what fashion is supposed to do, to stir you up. And then the building for the high fashion house should also do something similar. And it succeeds. Yes, with an immense cost, of course, uh, of course, you cannot truly breathe there. I mean, if you are not equipped properly financially, probably you would not think to, to go inside the store because you might run out of uh, oxygen, of, of breath. But, uh, and this happens. I, I know very well. You go into such a place, you know, in fact, you feel more intimidated than in a sacred space. It's, you can barely breathe. Uh, uh, because it's not for mortals, really. This is for uh, a certain elite. And uh, the stair is uh, dramatic, uh, and I like it, but I wonder, you know, Borromini used uh, the Baroque uh, art to quest for God. What are we questing for with our own present-day Baroque, which is, uh, as I call it, an angst Baroque? What are we questing, actually? In a way, what I see here is a tempest in a cup of tea. This is what I see. The cup of tea is the rectangular space or building. And then in this uh, tornado inside it, which actually you wonder, what is its raison d'etre? <laughs> well, I, I, I think Massimiliano Fuxas and Doriana, they, uh, um, Doriana, Doriana, I think, I have to 
first name. Um, I think they try to express to, to vent their frustrations because there is a picture, and I don't have it here, unfortunately, with them and uh, another pair. It, it, I'm not sure. Maybe even Giorgio Armani, uh, but it doesn't matter. Uh, what matters is that uh, Massimiliano Fuchs has dressed otherwise very elegantly with a beautiful black suit, but he has a pair of sneakers. Yeah, of course, made on Mars and for Martians, but uh, I don't know, it's kind of strange, you know. Uh, yes, I'm old fashioned. I, I, it's hard for me to accept a, a, a black suit with sneakers. <laughs> This is Massimiliano Fuxas uh, trying to intimidate me, to make me shut, shut up, maybe. Anyway, the, I like the stair, it's nice. It's uh, almost as nice as San Carlo alle Quattro Fontane. But what is actually its raison d'etre? All the drama there, you know. <laughs> well, uh, Mr. Armani afforded, of course, to pay for it, and he did, and it's an interesting, uh, addition to his uh, vocabulary of, uh, of uh, noticeable uh, aesthetical um, provocations. Although his clothing is kind of, uh, you know, subdued, although the price is not subdued, but the aesthetics are, um, you know, if not severe, uh, uh, reticent, uh, and, uh, and so on. There is a problem, though. I, if you allow me a suggestion, if if you save enough money to buy a suit by Giorgio Armani or you know something by a great uh, designer, please be very careful. Moths love them. Moths have a problem. I mean, not a problem. They really love the good thing. I know. <laughs> I know this. Moths love the best materials and the best designers. So please be very careful, because if you buy an expensive piece of clothing, the moths will attack it. So you have to take very good care of, of, of them, because uh, these uh, strange creatures have very, very, they have an exquisite taste. That's what I'm trying to say. In fact, I even thought of the possibility to open a, a fashion line with, uh, uh, um, with clothing, or pieces of clothes that have been uh, eroded, so to speak, by moths. You know, yes, you launch a, a fashion line like that, you know, and, and uh, the moths would have that effect on the aesthetics of the, of the clothing, like, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, you know, the uh, certain erosions of buildings or the ripped jeans and uh, or the, I'm thinking of the park by Jean Nouvel in, in Barcelona, which I showed yesterday. Anyway, coming back uh, to, the, to, the, to the stair, I, I am impressed. I, I, I like it even during construction. Uh, it's, it's visceral, it's brutal, it's rough, it's raw. It's metal, it's obviously standing, it's not a risk to use it. It probably was, you could have built a, an apartment building with the money, our money built for it. But we need also, uh, uh, you know, provocations, aesthetical provocations and even beauty. And uh, yeah, I wish I had a few more pictures with this, but I don't. We go to the other Armani house built by uh, Studio Fuchsash uh, in Hong Kong this time. Uh, here also he is playing with spirals and he adds color. And uh, yes, I think it's nice. Uh, it's nice, um, but uh, again, not everybody can breathe there because not everybody is, uh, is sustained by uh, the necessary finances. Um, Anyway, I remember the manifesto that Mark Wigley wrote uh, towards turbulence with which he tried to provoke his students at Columbia in New York. Now you cannot find it any longer and I couldn't find it any longer on the web. Maybe he changed his mind about it, but it was a nice writing uh, about inviting to turbulence. And in a way here we see some kind of turbulence now. Well, decorative to an extent, if there is such a thing, uh, decorative turbulence. 
it's the knot is the intertwining is the twisting is the sabotaging of reason that's what it is and of cartesianism but we need maybe both Rem Kolchas again in uh, for Prada again, but in Milano uh, is the foundation Fondation uh, uh, Fondazione Prada. Uh, uh, there are several buildings. Uh, uh, they are they are very different from what Massimiliano Fuchsas, uh, I mean Studio Fuchsas did. Fondazione Prada, the Torre, but it's not just the. Uh, um, I imagine I don't know Italian to my shame. I imagine Miss Tower, but. Uh, there are several buildings. There is some kind of a frigid surrealism, if I can use these words. You know, that building, uh, of course, the, it existed. It, it is just an intervention to bring to life, so to speak, maybe some old uh, industrial buildings. And you can almost see the cynicism of Rem Kolchas. You know, uh, he made it into a gold building, but it's, I don't know. I don't know. It's. I find it, uh, you know, kind of uh, gray. Although it is goldish, uh, it's. Um, what does he say? What does Rem Kolchas say to us through this building? You know, uh, like today I read. He said, "Well, with the money the governments are putting into bringing back economies to life, they could have uh, solved the problem of the climate change." I don't know. He's never satisfied, but he's still provocative in terms of his architecture. And uh, uh, this tower is also kind of interesting. But uh, you know, it's his vocabulary. You know, he he did something to an extent similar to an extent in in Berlin. Uh, you know, he introduces these distortions, as you know. He's a modernist uh, with a little. Uh, 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 taste for um, for uh, uh, provocations and uh, a, a certain amount of cynicism, but he's interesting. And as I said, I, I see something almost metaphysical here. I'm thinking a little bit of Giorgio de Chirico, maybe because there I see no cars, no people really, and just this this you know cleaned up buildings to an extent. But there is something. Uh, grayish here. It, it, it's a, almost a surreal uh, fragment of, of, of a city. And that uh, golden thing, I don't know what it symbolizes, but we are dealing with Prada. So I guess the gold, um, you know, and, and maybe that's where they have their offices. I see the entrances in the corner, Fondazione Prada. So we are, we are dealing with some kind of um, high caliber uh, divinities here. So it had to be gold, you know. Uh, I remember again that uh, movie without the, uh, the the appropriate sound um, by um, Fellini somehow. Who are the gods of the present, you know? Who are they? The manufacturers of bags and financial speculators you know, the founders of uh, big enterprises like Amazon and eBay, or, uh, you know, uh, Microsoft World, you know. I lived, I lived for several months with an architect who worked for the house of uh, Bill Gates. And he told me that Bill Gates, of course he has several houses, but the house, his main house, where he lives with his wife, and maybe with a few other people who help them, you know, uh, to manage the house. It's a big house. It has 27 bathrooms. So this is the man who fights for the welfare of the world to save water in Africa and uh, to save many other things, to even save us from the pandemic. But he has 27 bathrooms. I mean, isn't it insane? You could almost psychoanalyze him that someone with a lot of sins needed so much washing, you know, to purge himself. So the number of bathrooms is proportionate with the number of sins he might think he might have. 
I don't know, but to build a house with 27 bathrooms in which you live with your wife and with a few more people, to me is uh, certainly not saving the world. But again, these are the gods of our day. You know, we, we trust th those who make it. We trust those who become immensely uh, and decently rich. We think that they are, they are the lights of the world and we look with reverence in a way towards them. But, but are they really so full of, uh, of uh, inspiration towards us? You know, I'm re re really questioning. There are very, uh, I'm convinced in any country of the world, there are, uh, 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 um, there are people that we can learn from. There are people who have, uh, um, you know, who are serious, who are sensitive, who create valuable things who contribute to, to thought, to art, to you name it. But no one knows of them, really. We only know these uh, so-called stars, but, but their value to me often, not always, often is very questionable, really. The heroes of the present, many of them, I would argue that they are very questionable. I mean, what is so great about the, the founder of, uh, of eBay, for God's sake, you know? <laughs> anyway, uh, just uh, I allow myself now that I have the chance to talk with an, uh, to have an audience. <laughs> I vent my own um, intimate and maybe highly subjective and deplorable thoughts. Okay, back to Ram Kolhas, the man who, uh, you know, he is uh, sufficiently uh, uh, rebellious to uh, assert his rebelliousness through his uh, Lamborghini or Maserati and, uh, you know, he's uh, very concerned about the well-being of the world, who also wants to bring Prada to the villages of the world because he's now very concerned about rurality about the forgotten half of the world. And I wonder how can you marry the manufacturer of bells that cost thousands of euros with the realities of a poor village? How? There are, there are two different worlds. Anyway, but the tower is kind of interesting. And yes, the avant-garde, I continue to believe, lost its soul. It was bought by the manufacturers of the aforementioned belts and bags and other highly divine accessories. Yeah. Anyway, how many, how many social housing uh, complexes build, did uh, Rem Kolhas build? I, I know of none. I know of none being built by, uh, uh, by Zaha or uh, Frank Gehry. So are they the so pristine uh, morally and maybe not just morally, I, I, I wonder. Again, who are the stars of today, you know, and what do they mean to the world? Uh, yes, they, they, uh, they uh, excite us sometimes and in this sense they are, I guess, necessary, but uh, I don't know, maybe I'm naive uh, and uh, unbearably uh, romantic. Uh, I, I, I would like to, to be inspired by some kind, some other kind of, uh, other kind of, uh, other kind of people, you know. Uh, anyway, Herzog and de Moron. Now this is an interesting building by, uh, by two skillful architects, as you know, and you probably know this building. Also for Prada, Prada is very interested in architecture, as you can see, and also in Tokyo. Uh, it's a good building. It's an interesting building. But again, when you think about it, it's a sanctuary for what? For bags, for shoes, and for belts. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. These fetishizations of these accessories to me is partly difficult to sustain. But the building is interesting. And of course, they save a lot of energy because, as you can see, they have, uh, through this building, they can easily obtain cross-ventilation by opening the windows, no? Like in old houses, you know, old architectures. 
I'm sarcastic, of course. No window opens. It's, uh, it's uh, the skin of the building is hermetic. Even if it gives the impression that uh, it's connected with the world outside of it through transparency, in essence, it is not connected. It is sealed off. So again, the demagogy of glass. None of these things open. So, uh, you know, without air conditioning, uh, uh, you die there. But Prada has no problem to pay the bills. As Philip Johnson didn't have problems either. But at least he commented upon it that yes, uh, it is expensive. When you have this uh, glass carcass, expect some huge bills, both in the winter and the summer. Otherwise, of course, it's a nice Swiss building in, uh, in Japan and the plants are nice. And everything is nice, even the lettering, you know, it's done, uh, you know, digitally and uh, uh, it's great. Every plan is, is nice, it's convincing, it's interesting, it's, it's moving, it's dynamic. There are diagonals, there is movement here, there is uh, a lot of uh, playfulness. But again, you wonder what for? you know, for some bags and some belts and maybe some shoes. I don't know. The temple of accessories, you know. <laughs> of course you want to go to Mars. Of, of course you want to go to the moon in despair. Because how much can, can a belt or a bag or a pair of shoes actually, even a pair of shoes, I actually like shoes, but anyway, even a pair of shoes can, uh, can warm up your heart. Really, how much? And, and they are displayed uh, in, in, in this uh, religious manner, you know, is... Uh, uh, anyway. <laughs> I mean, how many shoes do we have to create? I, I'm totally on the side of uh, Tarkovsky and that uh, drunk. Uh, a drunk poet in nostalgia. Anyway, and you see there is a person there, she's probably the doorkeeper and uh, I, I'm not sure anyone can enter this building really. <laughs> uh, with a mask or without a mask, uh, this is not for anybody really. I wouldn't even attempt to enter, I would feel inadequate. Uh, anyway, but Herzog and the Moro are uh, good, you know. Uh, and here we have also the, 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 the tree-like um, structure, which is um, both structure and ornament uh, that also Toyohito used. And there are real trees uh, on the street, maybe it's on the very same street where Toyohito built his building. I didn't uh, double check on this. Mark Taylor. And we are ending now. Now maybe you don't know of Mark, Mark C. Taylor. I would have known either, I would not have known uh, this name if I didn't learn about him from a lecture at Columbia University in New York. He is not an architect, he's a writer and a thinker, a philosopher. He wrote a book that was very influential at the end of the millennium uh, and uh, where he debated many, many issues. But one of them was the relationship between fashion and religion or spirit. And uh, I had this book, but I lost it. Uh, I gave it to someone and uh, it got lost. Uh, somebody said, never, never lend uh, books because they, they get lost. It's kind of true. But I, I still do it a lot of time. Anyway, this is the gentleman, the thinker. Uh, uh, <laughs> he doesn't really look like a thinker, but uh, then we are talking about postmodernism. We are talking about uh, contemporaneity. Uh, and uh, he wrote this book called Hiding, kind of interesting, and it did relate, even the word, I think, relates to the theme of fashion, because I think we are hiding behind fashion, in a way. 
fashion is a shield behind which I think we, are, we tremble. But it's much easier to cover ourselves with, um, you know, uh, glittering uh, uh, illusions than to face the trembling uh, self. And I will read a few things, and this will be the end of this presentation, because I think it, it is interesting, and maybe it will incite you to maybe even purchase the book or to investigate further. Maybe you can even find it online. So the age of information, media, and virtuality is transforming every aspect of human experience. He wrote this at the end of the 20th century, and of course he was right, and we are living in the midst of it. Questions that have long haunted the philosophical imagination are becoming urgent practical concerns. Where does the natural end and the artificial begin? Is there a difference between the material and the immaterial? In his new work, Mark C. Taylor extends his ongoing investigation of postmodern worlds by critically examining a, wild, a wide range of contemporary cultural practices. Nothing defines postmodernism so well as its refusal of depth, its emphasis on appearance and spectacle, its tendency to collapse a three-dimensional world in which image and reality are distinct into a, uh, a two-dimensional world in which they merge. The postmodern world, Taylor argues, is a world of surfaces, and the postmodern condition is one of profound superficiality, hence uh, fashion. We go on. For many cultural commentators, postmodernism's inescapable play of surfaces is cause of despair. Taylor, on the other hand, shows that the disappearance of depth in postmodern culture is actually a liberation replete with creative possibilities. Taylor introduces readers to a popular culture in which detectives, the postmodern heroes of Paul Auster and Dennis Potter, lift surfaces only to find more surfaces and in which fashion advertising plays transparency against hiding. Taylor looks at the contemporary preoccupation with body piercing and tattooing hello, Adolf Loss, and asks whether these practices actually reveal or conceal phrenology and skin diseases, the religious architecture, so-called religious architecture of Las Vegas, hello, Venturi, the limitless spread of computer networks, all are brought within the scope of Taylor's brilliant analysis. Postmodernism, he shows, has given us a new sense of the superficial, one in which the issue is not the absence of meaning, but its uncontrollable ecstatic proliferation. And embodying the very tendencies it analyzes, Hiding is Unique, the name of his book, conceived and developed with well-known designers Michael Rock and Susan Sellers, this work transgresses the boundary that customer, customary customarily separates graphic design from the story within a text. The product of nearly three decades of reflection and writing, hiding opens a window on contemporary culture. To follow the remarkable course Taylor charts is to see both our present and past differently and to encounter a future as disorienting as it is alluring. And with this, I end. And we can talk now about fashion and this uh, disorienting and alluring future, if you want. Thank you. I have another present presentation with the House for Lady Gaga, but I'll show it to you only if you are not yet tired of me. Hi. Hi. Oh my gosh, it was horrible. Um, I told my sister that my, um, my balcony got flower washed. Yeah, I had to put um, a, a towel. Okay, <laughs> maybe someone else who talks uh, less privately, um, you know, will, will say something. Uh, Dan, you yeah. know about the Prada Foundation in the 
Milan, I had the opportunity to assist at the opening of this house. In the Golden Tower, there is a, the, the whole foundation is dedicated to collecting and presenting art. Uh, there, there is nothing uh, about fashion inside. Uh, not even, uh, not even far, you know. It's only very sophisticated art collections and exhibitions. And even uh, in the Gold Tower, there, there are some collected works of some strange and disturbed artist. I don't know his name, which is presenting some fetishes and icons of a very troubled and traumatic childhood. You know. That's the content of the golden uh, of the golden tower. And yes, the foundation. Thank you. Yes, yes, uh, and uh, call has. Uh, I don't hear you very well. Yes, I, yes, I. Now you hear me. A little bit, I think. Yes. Okay. Uh, Thank you. Uh, the first exhibition was curated by Kolhas and it was dedicated to the lack of originality of classic art. So he was, it was extremely expensive. They brought classic uh, and Greek, Roman and classic art from wherever you can imagine, you know, Metropolitan, you know, Hermitage, whatever. And uh, he was trying to demonstrate that classic ha art has no originality. These guys were copying each other infinitely. And that was the opening exhibition. Yes. Yeah, uh, I mean, uh, you know, Mark C. Taylor was uh, 